This is episode 53. This is The Business of Architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is The Business of Architecture show, where we talk about what they don't teach us in school, which is how to run a great business, so we don't have to worry about paying the bills. Now, today I have, I'm going to welcome back my guest, Mariana Idiarte. She's an independent business consultant specialized in the business and client relationship management of the international creative industry with a focus on architecture, design, and cultural organization. So, Mariana, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Inuk. Thank you for having me back in your show. Last time we, we talked, which was a few episodes back, we had a great conversation. You talked about the work you've done with Rem Coolhouse's firm, OMA, on contract negotiations and talked about some of the different things that architects find or especially those larger firms find are more important. Could you tell me about the, uh, when negotiating a larger contract like that, what are some of the most important clauses that architects don't like to back down on? Well, uh, whether it's a large or a short contract, uh, the the clauses are always most important uh, for architects are those relating to uh, author uh, rights, uh, copyrights, uh, and limitation of liability. Uh, then you have also the clauses related to uh, termination of a contract or delay in, in, in the work, or if the, the project is suspended for some reason, how to deal with those situations. That, of course, besides the financial. I missed the last, I think we're breaking up a little bit there. I missed the very last sentence, Mariana. I, I mentioned that uh, after uh, copyrights and uh, limitation of liability uh, and the financial uh, conditions are, of course, important. And the clauses related to the termination of agree uh, agreement or how to deal in the case the project is delayed or suspended. Okay. So let's talk about the financial conditions. What are some various, can you give me an example of some financial conditions? And let's talk a little bit about the different scenarios that you've seen in the past and maybe things that have been sticky. Well, when it's about financial conditions, uh, you ask me some scenarios and I always say the possibilities are endless. Uh, I, to give you an example, I, I, I teach uh, architecture students uh, here in the Netherlands. Uh, and uh, uh, sometimes I do an exercise. I, I ask them to come up with uh, at least 10 options to negotiate fees without the bargaining of, okay, uh, we'll settle between 1% or 2% more or a price. And they first look totally surprised, like, how are we going to do that? And once we start talking and they start thinking, there's there's not only 10, sometimes there are 20 options coming out of the t working tables. Uh, it, you have to consider a lot of things when, when negotiating financials. First, first of all, you have to know as a firm your finances very well. You have to know your fees. Uh, uh, architects working independently or smaller firms have uh, sometimes... Uh, so especially when starting, they, they set their fees, their hourly rates or something without actually knowing what, uh, how much you need, how much your time costs, how much cost your firm does uh, to be just running, basically, or if you have personnel, etc., etc. Uh, so, so first you have to get into the insights of what your fees are, what your costs are, and then you can think about, okay, how you negotiate something else. Secondly, another uh, very important part is uh, knowing what a project costs to be realized. Uh, people more experienced in project management will have a very fairly good idea of uh, how much time, etc., a project may cost, and therefore how much uh, uh, time uh, you're going to charge eventually. Uh, and um, finally, you also have to look at the market, uh, what your competition is charging, uh, how, how all external elements that have to do with uh, negotiating uh, financials. Uh, 
uh, and so within within the market. That having said that, you have also uh, to consider uh, the client, of course, and what type of client it is. Uh, something that in, in in other business sectors is very usual is doing a financial check of your clients, for instance, to know whether they're actually uh, um, financially uh, strong enough to undertake on a project and pay you in the next two or three years or how long you're going to be working with them. That is very usual in other sectors, but architects somehow, at least uh, those I, I work with uh, uh, from larger, smaller firms, uh, just forget that. They, you know, most people get simply so excited about a new project uh, and once you get the agreement to go ahead or, or at least to send a proposal, uh, yeah, you, nobody start, stop thinking about actually uh, is my client solvent uh, to undertake on this. So that that uh, uh, that wouldn't hurt. At least in some cases, you have to observe your clients on on determine based on experience, but also uh, take a step back, uh, have a broader perspective on on analyze the situation uh, of your client of your of the environment, etc. Uh, working for governments, for instance, uh, they typically, and depending where you work, uh, they tend to be reliable, uh, but they're also very structurized in terms of their conditions, their processes, uh, and sometimes uh, with payments, for instance. They, you know, it's, it's not strange that some uh, uh, governmental institutions have very lengthy procedures to process payments. And so when you're counting, oh, I'm going to get paid within two weeks or within a month, it may actually take three times longer. So it is worth uh, looking into how, how the process naturally works uh, for for the client or maybe arrange something that accommodates uh, your Necessity is better on that you make sure that you're going to uh, manage your cash flow uh, accordingly. On the other hand, they, you know, it, it's always a, uh, you can, you can never look into a uh, clause of a contract independently. You have to look at the negotiation process as a whole on determining uh, why is the project important for your firm. Is it a question of I need the project because it pays the bills, or is it a strategic project because the client may uh, mean that you're going to get a lot more work further on, or is it a very prestigious uh, job that you want to do uh, that will help you build a great reputation in a sector you want to work? So you're or maybe have the room and possibility to be more flexible in other areas. So. Uh, looking at the overall goals uh, of you personally or, or your firm professionally are key to determining what clauses are important and how to deal with them. Sure. At the beginning, Mariana, you mentioned a couple things that are important in these kind of contracts. The first one being copyright, the second one being liability, and the third one being the termination clauses. Mm -hmm. I want to talk to you for a minute just about the copyright clauses. What kind of difficulties do are you seeing architects run into with the copyright clauses? Is is that important for clients, and do clients really even care about the copyright clause? Uh, I think they do, definitely they do. And uh, I, um, I'm making a, um, something very clear here. I'm, I'm not a, a lawyer, so I don't have a law degree and I don't know exactly the whole law. I do have experience enough uh, in the contracts and I've learned, I've worked with fantastic lawyers next to me, so I know uh, quite a lot to understand the broader picture about what the situation with a uh, copyrights is for architects and for other creatives, for that matter. Uh, with, put very simply, uh, someone who creates an original work uh, owns the rights, the intellectual property rights of, of their, their own work uh, without having to set anything in writing. And that applies for most of the countries in the world. There are exceptions, uh, but, uh, but that is the case. However, uh, 
there's typically a clause relating to copyrights in contracts, which doesn't hurt to have it. So that means that even if you don't have anything clarified on uh, about copyrights in a contract, you as an author have uh, intellectual property rights over your creation. Uh, how you work with that, um, that, that, is, that, that is what is different and may vary from one uh, situation to another, and that is why it's worth checking on what a contract says. Um, one of the main issues uh, that architects come up with uh, when it's about copyrights is when a, a client states in their contracts that the architect will transfer uh, or he renounced to his, his rights, uh, so that he transferred all rights to the client. Uh, well, that, that is typically an issue because that means while clients uh, are typically worried about having to ask the architect for every single little thing that they need to fix in, in their building once it's ready, uh, worried about, uh, they're afraid about uh, uh, having to do that and therefore paying the, the, the architect for anything that could be or not infringement of the architect's rights. Um, uh, there is a big difference between transferring of rights or, or uh, renouncing to your rights and providing a license to your client. It's, uh, you can compare it with uh, uh, when you, you have a car. If you rent a car, uh, you have the right to use the car for a certain amount of period, maybe in a determined territory uh, under certain conditions, but the car remains the property of the company uh, you rented the car from. Uh, if you buy a car, you own all the rights over the car. This is the same with, a, with a author, uh, the author of rights and, and copyrights. You, as the owner of the rights, have all the authority and all the freedom to determine, and you may allow someone to use the license on your right for a determined use. Uh, and this is what I always say to, to architects, you can, uh, typically when you find a clause uh, and the client says, oh, we want all the rights of the project, uh, ask them what they're worried about. Uh, and you can in most cases, offer the client a license as broad as needed to comply with their requirements without you transferring the rights to the client. And what would be some typical rights that the clients might request or things that they might want? Well, uh, one of the typical things is, of course, the one's right to, to the, for instance, publication, when it's uh, maybe a, a public building or, or some commercial building or something that maybe uh, a feature in magazines or something that uh, the one or or a commercial or something related to a commercial project uh, so therefore the the images of the building may be uh, shown in magazines or marketing campaigns communication campaigns so they want to have the right to do that and again the architect can uh, provide a license to the client to allow that use uh, for marketing purposes, communication purposes, publications, and internet or otherwise. And it, so it can be as broad as needed. Uh, then the other thing is that clients typically ask is the exclusivity as well. And this is something when there's a lot of, of interpretations on, on confusion about uh, because um, uh, the clients think, well, it's our design, we want a an unique and exceptional design, we don't want to be repeated, so we want the exclusivity of that. Well, while that may be the case, if you provide exclusive rights to someone, that means that you cannot provide license or rights to someone else. So if you give exclusive rights to your client to publish uh, photographies or work, uh, of, of, of your project, that means you can do that the same to provide, for instance, to an architecture magazine without asking the client for permission. So it is very technical, it is very tricky, and sometimes when it, uh, if it's very important projects or if it's 
of it, it's a very tricky client that gets very technical, it's definitely worth uh, considering uh, consulting a specialist, uh, uh, an intellectual property lawyer, for instance, or your local uh, like the AIA in America, your local architectures organization for advice uh, or other architects that may have gone through that. Uh, having said that, uh, I've also seen recently even a very large firm, important firm with a very prestigious project, a large uh, for a government organization. Uh, like I said before, uh, being a government organization, they have very uh, strict contracts and they're not very flexible and willing to change because that means that they may need to change it for all their uh, um, service providers. Uh, so they, the architects agreed to work on the project even where they uh, were obliged to cede some rights uh, remain referring to copyright, sure. which is it, it wasn't their typical, but again, it was a very prestigious project. They didn't have any reason to mistrust uh, the client being a government organization in, sure. in other terms, so they took the risk. Okay, Mariana, on this, on this, uh, my, the audience here that listens to Business of Architecture is primarily. Uh, people that work for or that own smaller firms. And mm -hmm. so the question comes to my mind, when you're working with these larger firms, you know, I know that my my, co my architectural contract is maybe maybe four or five pages long, maybe four. I mean, I, I like to keep it very simple for them. I know the standard AIA contract is, I don't have, haven't looked at one in a while, but 20 pages maybe, you know, the standard, mm -hmm. depending on all the different documents that you add to it. Just in terms of thickness, of these these larger contracts, what are we talking here? Just to give me an idea of how comprehensive these contracts are, are we talking 100 pages, 250? Well, I it, it's interesting that you mentioned that because I always said uh, a, a good contract is not a large contract, okay. uh, and you're absolutely right to work with a short, just a few pages contract if it contains just the uh, the, the few things that are there important for you. Uh, my standard terms and conditions are half an A4, for instance. Uh, and to start with, I have never had to, uh, to, to use them in the sense of never have to have, say to someone, hey, remember these conditions, uh, because I work on the relationship with my clients is much more important. And I, I hardly ever, with maybe one exception, had the problem of no one paying me, for instance, or, or mm -hmm. something else. So uh, it's, it's, it's much more important than that is, is like I said, seeing, uh, spending the time understanding, we talked about it in our previous session, spending the time of understanding who your client is, get, so that you get a feeling of what are potential risks or not uh, of entering into a working relationship with someone. Uh, and uh, if, if you spend enough time getting to know your client, uh, you'll be more comfortable into taking some risk. Uh, and also, uh, the negotiation may also be easier if you just take time to understand why are they so worried about protecting a clause or, or another or, or, or making specific points about that. That is, uh, I always said, is if a client is very... Um, uh, strong about keeping a certain clause that you may find a, a difficult one. Uh, that's like a red light uh, telling you there may be an issue down the road or he may be worried about that or he may be considering a risk that I'm not seeing and it's worth talking about it and mm -hmm. try to see how you solve it or how you potentially manage that risk together uh, before entering or in, into the work actually. Okay, so these larger contracts, uh, well, for these larger projects, are just order of magnitude. Yes, sorry, you said yeah, it's it could be anything. I mean, you said uh, the AIA contract is like twenty pages, where the standard, uh, the conditions, only the, stand, the terms and conditions from the standard Dutch contract are like 
uh, I think nowadays they change it. I think it's like more. It's like 40 pages or so. So I think you're not, yeah. you're not in a bad place at all. Having said that, I know that every state in the U.S. also had different laws applying to architects and the architectural profession and that some uh, are uh, more um, architect friendly than others. I don't know. Uh, maybe you, you have more experience into that. But uh, it's, it, it depends. I've also seen contracts uh, for super large projects. There are uh, like 300 pages. Uh, so <laughs> everything in between, yes. Okay. Well, I, I'm sure... I'm sure I'm going to get um, some people, you know, writing in and saying, Enoch, it's not 20 pages, it's 17 or it's it's 13. But I just wanted Definitely. to get an idea of uh, the great. kind of contracts some of these other firms are working with. So let's talk about liability, Mariana, because that's something that, as architects, we do worry a lot about that. There's a lot of personal liability involved with designing a project. And you did mm -hmm. mention that in your work with other architects, that that is one of the things that they will not back down on or that they hold very tightly to. What are some of the the, the pitfalls in liability or some of the exact clauses that architects should be thinking about in terms of liability? Well, the, the one pitfall is uh, not limiting your liability. Uh, basically, that's, the, that's it. Uh, uh, in, in any case, you, you should always limit your liability unless you're willing to lose maybe your uh, business on, or your private house even. <laughs> Uh, if, if you don't limit to that. So when uh, if a client is very, very uh, strong about uh, keeping an unlimited liability clause, uh, I would say that's definitely to worry about. Uh, how to deal with that? Uh, again, limited on, on there several ways to limit your liability. Well, what are the ways uh, you're seeing architects limiting liability? Well, one, one important rule and that applies for everybody is, again, in, like, like in the case of negotiating fees or financials, uh, knowing your insurance. Check your insurance terms. Uh, as, as an architect, you, you, you must have professional liability insurance, but uh, insurance providers also are different. On, they may vary, again, from one state to another. Uh, here in Europe, many uh, architects work the distances are shorter from one country to another, and, and there are differences. And so if you work in a broader territory, it's, it's worth spending the time. Again, ask, go and ask firms that are doing the same thing and they may have experience or contact your local architecture organization. Uh, and doing some search definitely uh, rewards. Uh, so knowing exactly what are you covered for. Uh, because that is the way, if you work for a lot of projects, you can always consider limiting to liability to whatever your insurance uh, covers for. Uh, that is already a good start. Uh, even better is saying limiting to your liability to uh, the uh, amount of uh, fees that you're receiving for some such a project. And, and anything in between, it may be just a random figure that may work for, for one okay. or another party. Okay. So those are, those are a couple of the applications that you see in yeah. architectural contracts. All right. And then termination, you talked about that. Have you ever been brought into any sticky situations with termination where maybe the contract wasn't worded correctly and it really was a problem? Mm, um, uh, yes. Uh, uh, recently, actually, um, someone consulted me. Uh, th this was a, a, a collaboration project between architects and designers uh, for a, something that was supposed to be uh, designed for a temporary exhibition in, in a particular location uh, as part of an overall project with, with multiple designers. And um, there was a the organization that signed the contract with the uh, architects and designers was the curators organization that uh, on its turn was had a contract with uh, uh, again a government organization who hired them to do this project. Uh, the project was to last a summer, and the contract that these curators set with the architects 
uh, wasn't a great contract. Uh, in, there was a clause there saying that after the project was finished, the, um, there was a kind of cooperative to be created to manage the, the, the work, the creative work that had been done and potentially exploited uh, further. Uh, now, what happened is that the government terminated the contract with uh, this curator, so this intermediate person, and, uh, and the, this person just decided not to, to terminate the contract, but there wasn't, uh, it, it wasn't reflecting the conditions of termination that she had agreed, of the, 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 the organization, had, the curator of the organization had agreed with the government. So, uh, so this, uh, the architects and designers uh, suffer a lot from that. And the conclusion of this intermediate organization was that the, the cooperative that was to manage the, the work after was never created. And the argument of the, the curator organization was, well, the contract was terminated, so that doesn't apply. We just retain all the rights on the project. Just say that. So uh, it, it's a shame when this this kind of consultation, on this, that's a typical case, just comes very late. Mm -hmm. uh, your negotiation power is minimum because the work has been done on and on getting all the people involved together to, to, have, to agree on how to deal with that is extremely difficult. So again, this is a good case of, it, there were a lot of unclear things, but in the enthusiasm of the designers to get into the project, they just signed the contract yeah. and went on with the work and the what problems are, came. What are, some, what are some typical termination clauses that you think architects need to be including in their contracts? If you're thinking about uh, these smaller firms. Well, uh, one of one of the most uh, typical issues is that if the contract is terminated uh, for for any reason that is not the fault of the architect, uh, is that any rights of license to use the rights that the client may have that return to the architect. So uh, that is that is one of uh, of, of the when most. We say rights of license. Are we talking once again about publication rights and everything that we? Yeah, on through? even the rights. Uh, no, for instance, suppose you do uh, you do a concept design. You you get up to develop a design phase uh, with the project. On the client said, "Oh, thank you very much." Uh, for your services, goodbye, and they go on and continue and implement a project and build it with a cheaper architect, or maybe, maybe even not, and you're not going to have the control of the project. You may have, uh, th this doesn't mean that you ha always have to do it that way. You may have agreed to do that work, and you may totally be happy with uh, allowing someone else to go uh, carry on with your work or, or change it, uh, or realize it in, in whatever way they please. But that is not typical. Uh, the typical way architects uh, I've been working with uh, want to work, so they they pretty much like to protect the rights up to completion of the project because it's the only way that you can guarantee the client that it's going to end up looking what you envisioned and what they agree to having, um, because again, it's your right as an author. Mm -hmm. So that is that could be that is one of the most most typical things. Um, the other situation, of course, it has to do with a uh, uh, notice for termination. If you enter into a project and therefore you had to hire a team of people to, to work with, on the project is suddenly terminated, but you have contracts uh, with the people that you hire to work on the project. Uh, uh, I, I always advise. Uh, architects, if you have subcontracts for people who are cooperating with you, always uh, place a clause saying that whether uh, you're going to pay after you get paid from the client, and that if the contract is terminated, that uh, you have the right to terminate the co contracts under the same conditions, for instance. That kind of things are uh, important to think of. Excellent. Well, Mariana, thank you very much. I think that's a bit, it's been a great conversation about contracts and about some of the things we've touched upon today. So thank you for joining us on the Business of Architecture and look forward to continuing the conversation next week.
You're welcome, Enoch. It was uh, well great to, to hear that you enjoy my ideas, too. Thanks. And that's a wrap. Thanks for writing along on another show about the business of architecture. I want to know your opinion about today's episode. Visit businessofarchitecture.com forward slash podcast or send me an email at show at businessofarchitecture.com with your feedback about today's show. And remember, visit businessofarchitecture.com forward slash free to grab your free membership pass to Business of Architecture Insider, where you'll have first access to free resources to help you run a great business. See you next week. views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you run a great business. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5. Do it anyway.